Welcome and greetings from Washington, DC. I'm Tanya Joshua, Deputy Director of Policy and Communications Lead in the Office of Insular Affairs at the US Department of the Interior. Thank you for joining us today for another episode of OIA Conversations. To learn more about people, programs, and issues that are important and relevant to the US territories and the city associated states. Today, we are having a conversation with the Honorable Congresswoman from American Samoa, Amua Amata Coleman Radelagan. First elected in 2014 by American Samoa to the House to the US House of Representatives, the Congresswoman has now completed her third two year term and was recent re recently reelected to her fourth term. The Congresswoman is also a commissioner to the White House Initiative on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders and so much more. So thank you, Talofa, Madam Congresswoman. Thank you for joining us today. Could you please begin by telling us where you uh, went to school and, and where you grew up? Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to uh, get out there and let people know uh, what we've been doing to not only serve people, American Samoa, but to help the people from across the Pacific region in any way we can. I was raised in American Samoa and I reside in my house of many years there. I work in Congress, but I try to fly home to the islands every month, depending on the legislative schedule. Some of our children have lived there for years and are still there. They love it. Congresswoman. Could you please tell us about your, your name and your title, Almua? I know you recently got a new title. Yes, well, uh, I should uh, add the uh, fact that uh, I grew up in so many parts of the, of the Pacific because of my father's work as governor of American Samoa, chief administrator of the Marshall Islands, followed by the Mariana Islands chief administrator. Then he was deputy high commissioner and high commissioner of Micronesia, which was known in those days as the press territory of the Pacific Islands. So. It was his work that took our family all over this region. And it enabled me to make friends, learn the languages and culture of these islands. And I'm on a first name basis with many of their leaders because our parents were friends. And so that's how the kids kind of got to know each other. Uh, but uh, with regard to my name, my uh, Samoan name, Amata, is actually 21 letters long. And uh, it's, a, it's a family name, and that means the beginning of royalty, whatever that means. It was my grandmother's name, and it has been in our family for generations. I really don't know anybody outside of our clan who actually has that name. Now, the first president of the Marshall Islands was named Amata Kabua, and he and dad were close like brothers. And actually, President Kabua's mother, Dorothy, named my sister, Rimanman, when she was born in Madrill, named her. Uh, this Marshallese name. It means Northern Star in Marshallese. And uh, she named uh, my sister long before the RMI flag was even uh, produced. So, but it is that star that's displayed on the RMI flag. So, the Manman has a special meaning to the people of the Republic of the Marshall Islands. Congresswoman, your father's work uh, is, is a incredibly important career on its own. One small piece that I didn't know about your father was that he is a survivor of uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor in December of just during that started World War II. Yes, that's right. As a matter of fact, he was, uh, was heading back to duty at Schofield Barracks that morning, and it was just that, that road he was taking. Uh, that was where the planes were coming in, and he and some of his buddies and uh, so um, they actually turned around and they saw all this smoke out there in the Pearl Harbor area and they started to head that way. And as the planes were coming in, they strafed uh, my father's Jeep. And so I was very uh, honored to be there for the 50th anniversary of the Pearl Harbor attack uh, with my father when he was given a uh, medal by President George H.W. Bush. And uh, I was there to witness that, so it was quite quite a thrill. But uh, you asked it, uh, where I went to school a little bit earlier. And I attended elementary school at St. Francis de Pua in American Samoa. At the same time, I attended Pastor Samoan School, which is totally in a Samoan language, and it's primarily a religious kind of school. And uh, we learn who made you and, and uh, so forth and so on. But uh, around the sixth grade or so, uh, 
I moved from St. Francis over to Fie Loire, uh School in Utile, and I was there until the ninth grade. Well, then right about that time, my parents uh, moved to the Marshall Islands. Uh, President Kennedy decided to send him out. Uh, President Eisenhower's term was over. And so uh, they decided that I should go to school in Hawaii, not knowing what we were going to be encountering in the Marshall Islands as my parents were not that familiar with those islands at that point. So uh, I uh, went to school in Hawaii and, and uh, I graduated from Sacred Hearts Academy in Kaimuki. So uh, then a bachelor's degree from the University of Guam with additional studies from George Mason and Marilla Marymount Universities. And in 2017, I was humbled to be awarded a PhD honoraris from Virginia University of Science and Technology and a Doctor of Laws by my alma mater, University of Guam, as one of their distinguished alumni. So I was very humbled by it. Congresswoman, could you, um, could you expound a little bit on your title, your new uh, chiefly title? It is Uifakali, and it's from the village of Pamukamo. Uh, that is where my father was born. And it also was my father's title before then, and it is a high chief title. Uh, and so this is, these titles are not just uh, that you just go out and attach it to your name. As a matter of fact, the entire full family, extended family and, and otherwise, they get together and they, uh, they decide who should, because this is the head of the clan, who should hold the Wifatali title. So it took several, years of uh, hemming and hawing and discussion from all from all segments of my family and uh, then i remember it because it was valentine's day in uh, 2020 that uh, i officially uh, was given the title congresswoman i um could you tell us about the mask i understand there's a new federal uh, mandate for mask wearing from president biden is that why you're wearing your mask? Yes, it is. And um, I've come to understand that some of our people are, are not happy with the vaccine and uh, a number of them have refused to take the vaccine. And as you know, we are the only part of the United States that uh, uh, has not a single positive COVID case. So the people really don't wear face masks down there. But as we begin to repatriate uh, almost a thousand American Samoans that were st stuck off island for a good part of 2020, I think everybody needs to be encouraged to uh, wash their hands, uh, socially distance, and to keep that mask on. Thank you, Congresswoman. And I, I am socially social distancing in my home, so that's why I'm not wearing a mask. Um, but but otherwise, I am a federal employee, so when I do go into the office, I, I would definitely wear a mask. Um, Congresswoman, you were in American Samoa. Thank you for pointing out that the territory is the only U.S. territory without COVID-19. You were recently um, in American Samoa. You were actually there for quite a while because of uh, COVID and the borders being shut down. Yes, I was there for almost seven months, and uh, that did not stop me from getting my congressional work done. But uh, since American Samoa is seven hours behind uh, Washington, uh, the congressional hearings continued, and generally the hearings on the Hill start at 9 a.m. or 10 a.m. Well, uh, 10 a.m. means it's 3 a.m. in Pamo Pamo, or 2 a.m. as the case may be, and then if the staff is going to be involved with setting things up, well, then that means we all have to get up yet another hour earlier. So it was it was a challenge, but uh, we got our work done. I did not miss out on any of my duty and responsibilities on Capitol Hill. And so now here I am back in Washington, D.C. But looking forward to uh, going home just as soon as my legislator calendar allows for it, and that we are able to sort out uh, the COVID-19 issues of travel. 
Congressman, could we go back a little bit? I wanted to go back to your election. You talked to me one at one time about um, running for office, uh, even prior to being elected. Could you comment on that? Well, I. It's never been my intention to go into politics, as my background is in psychology. However, as I mentioned, my father's career as a public service servant uh, spanned five decades. And as a result, I grew up in the public eye. And over the years, I stayed active in my community, uh, serving people as a volunteer. And one thing led to another. I, I did spend 16 years in government house in American Samoa. And um, we had normal chores. Our parents, uh, my father, for instance, the, the front lawn of, of government house, well, there were so many of us and, and the whole thing was kind of chopped up uh, in little blocks and each child was responsible for keeping that particular block of land, uh, the grass cut, the, the weeds pulled and everything. And, and we had inspection. My father was quite busy, but he always made it a point to come in and uh, do that. Another thing was that uh, we do have a staff at the government house. You would never know it with us because we had to do all of our things ourselves. And that meant when you get up in the morning, get ready for school, you make your own bed. And uh, none of this people are going to come in and make your bed for you. No, um, my mother insisted that each of us make the bed. Well, I had nothing but brothers at that time. So they lived in like a little dormitory. And the little princess, at least that's what my brothers accused me of, uh, had her own bedroom and her own bed. And uh, so that was kind of nice too. I understand there were 12 of you? Uh, yes, uh, there were actually 12. And then the 13th child, the one month, was born in the Marshall Islands some years later. Well, I'm so proud that we could share a bit of our heritage, our geography, uh, Micronesia to Polynesia, north to south. Um, Congresswoman, I, I wanted to know about your work. Oh, actually, could you speak to us about your elections? You mentioned running for office previously, which I thought was an interesting comment about persistence. Well, um, in 1994, I decided to run for Congress. And uh, it was interesting because I had talked to my father about running for Congress. And he said, oh, well, let me tell you, it's a good idea, but there's only one problem. You are female, and it's going to be very difficult for you. He says, there's no doubt that I think that you would do well in Congress, but uh, that is not how our people think. They do not think that women's place is in the US House of Representatives. So if you are persistent and uh, you keep trying, um, I have no doubt that you will do it, but I estimate that it's gonna take you about 20 years before you finally possibly get in. Well, sure enough, because in 1994, I ran for Congress and I did run 10 consecutive times after that. And um, although my vote percentages were not too bad, still in all, I um, did not, uh, how should I say, I did not make it in. And, but um, as I uh, mentioned, women were never encouraged to run for high leadership positions. And I, myself, thought that needs to change because the women are really the ones out in the Pacific Islands, they're the ones who really get the work done and they don't seem to mind not taking the credit for it. They just get it done, take care of the children, the family and everything else that needs to be done. And then just sit quietly by while the, the male head of the household takes the credit for everything. But at any rate, I, I strongly believed I could make a, a difference. So I did persist. And I think that 2014 was the most difficult time that I ran because there were nine candidates running for Congress, including, of course, the 13 term incumbent in Congress, as well as a two term governor. He had just completed his second term and we are term limited. In other words, you stand down for one term and then you can run again after that. So he decided uh, to jump into the congressional race. 
And so there were actually nine of us. It was really quite amazing. So just imagine my surprise and, and disbelief uh, when the dust cleared. And then for me to find out I had won. As a matter of fact, when people told me, I actually got angry with them because I thought they were making fun of me because they had been so used to seeing me lose for 20 years straight, 22 years. At any rate, 2014, that was my uh, first one. Uh, and, and I was really very warmly welcomed into Congress. I wasn't quite sure how everybody was going to take me, but it was, and I was just very humbled that as a freshman, uh, I was immediately pulled into the leadership and asked to chair a key subcommittee uh, uh, on small business and uh, chair a, uh, a, be vice chair of a subcommittee on natural resources. So, but at any rate, two years after 2014, I was reelected with 75%. And then in 2018 with 82%. And then of course, in November 3rd, 2020, I did receive a clear mandate from our people with almost 85% of the vote, the highest ever in the history of American Samoa, whether it's congressional or the governor's race. So God has been very good to me. I am blessed and it is all to the glory of God. Congratulations on that resounding mandate. And uh, thank you for the work that you do. You represent the people of American Samoa. You represent uh, Native Hawaiians, Pacific Islanders, you know, issues. You, you look out for those issues that concern Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders uh, and, and Americans in general. Can you speak to a little bit of the work that you have done uh, and, and what you intend to do in the new 117th Congress, your priorities? Sure. My priorities for 2021 are the same as they were in the 116th Congress securing general funds for the territory, improvements to Medicaid and veterans health care, improvements to education for the next generation. I think the top priority for American Samoa is always equality in both federal funding and self-determination issues. Parity in Medicaid funding is an essential item and top priority. We passed legislation that increased the federal share of Medicaid costs from 55 to 83%, and we want to build on that success. So I'm an original co-sponsor of expanded Medicaid legislation of all the territories, and we will continue to work to expand these benefits for full funding, just like the states. I'm also working on additional coral reef protection legislation, and in the meantime, making sure we are equally covered in all the ongoing emergency legislation related to coronavirus. Now, in American Samoa, we have received our first vaccine doses and the second one as well. And um, I myself have received both doses and grateful to the administration for the successful efforts of Operation Warp Speed. I was particularly grateful for the vaccine doses so that I could encourage my constituents to think about taking it and uh, to reconsider if they don't want to do this. As far as uh, my actual committee work, I, uh, I do serve on the House Natural Resources Committee, as well as the Small Business Committee and the Veterans Committee, where I uh, serve as vice ranking member for the Veterans Committee. But this year, I'm going to be for the Small Business Committee, I will be ranking member of one of the key subcommittees. And so I'm looking forward to uh, doing that as well. Congresswoman, would you like to comment on the service that American Samoans provide in, in the U.S. Armed Forces? We are so very proud of our many military families and those serving. Everywhere I go, I find them. The forts in the U.S. I've been to the Middle East for the last two or three Christmases to serve uh, Christmas meals to our troops. Hundreds and hundreds. And uh, as well as visited them in the Northern Triangle, Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador, you name it. And you know, I was amazed when I got to Honduras to meet up with uh, one of our young women. She is a Marine captain and she is a pilot. And so it was quite amazing because when we came down from the airplane, 
there were all these Marines standing there and the ones from Puerto Rico, wow, there were many of them. And right at the end of the line of Puerto Rico, there was one Marine standing there with a little eight by 10 inch cage with the American Samoa flag on it. And so I was just so proud to learn that she, uh, from Aua village uh, is a, a helicopter pilot in these very difficult uh, areas. But um, so, you know, for the last two of the five years, for two of the last five years, as you know, American Samoa has been first per capita in US Army enlistment. And the Pango Pango recruiting station has been number one or two many times over the years. All you have to do is visit the Army's uh, website um, to see that. And so we also have the record for the most recruits right out of high school with uh, 78 for any jurisdiction per capita. There's a long history of service, my father included, and my chief of staff, Colonel Rafael Nayan, the first Samoan West Point graduate ever. And we have many veterans living on the island, and I'm very proud of all of them. That's amazing, Congresswoman, because the national average for people serving in the military is less than 1%, the national average. So um, congratulations. I'm very proud of, of that uh, record for American Samoa. Congresswoman, would you like to expound a little bit? You mentioned that you travel uh, across the country and visit Pacific Islander communities. Um, I actually received a call once from a friend in South Carolina who was very excited about having been at a meeting that you went and met with a bunch of Pacific Islanders down there. Yes, I do. I do a lot of outreach with our many Samoan communities across the nation. And let me tell you that uh, Congress does not pay for that. I want to clarify that. Uh, Congress pays for me to fly from American Samoa to Capitol Hill. And when it's time to go home from Capitol Hill back to the home district. Any other traveling that I do to the many Samoan communities, it does come out of my pocket. But I'm just delighted to do it because um, it's. I learned so much more because many of these um, uh, military people, they, uh, they still have strong ties to the island. So I look forward to every chance that I have to, uh, to visit with uh, not only Samoans, but uh, Pacific Islanders across the nation. Uh, Congresswoman, you're a commissioner on the White House Initiative for Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. Would you care to comment on that? Uh, yes, I have. Uh, I was appointed by the president. It's a two year term. Uh, it comes to an end this September. But uh, prior to that, I was the, uh, the commissioner, the same commission uh, appointed by President George W. Bush. And at that time, there were 15 uh, commissioners and I was the only Pacific Islander on this committee. At that time, we worked on health disparities throughout these uh, Asian Pacific American communities. And uh, so we did issue a report and recommendation to the, the president at that time. And this year, we just completed our report and uh, I am in the process of sending it out to um, the governor, the different leaders. Uh, and so that caps the work that we've been doing for the last couple of years. And it's been very uh, self-fulfilling work. And I wanna thank you for uh, being there at, uh, at the swearing in when Vice President Pence swore the, com swore the commissioners in uh, at the White House. It was an honor to participate in that event. Um, for the first time ever, the executive order, and we'll have to put a, a link on the screen to share with folks, uh, it included specific mention of the US territories, uh, as well as the freely associated states. So uh, I thank you for your hand in, in that in that work. Congresswoman, would you could you comment on the national being a national American Samoa nationals and American and citizenship in the United States? U.S. citizenship? As you know, the uh, definition of a U.S. citizen is someone who owes permanent allegiance to the United States. 
and the definition of a U.S. national is a non-U.S. citizen who owes permanent allegiance to the United States. The two statuses are really almost identical with many of the same rights and privileges. For example, U.S. nationals hold U.S. passports. They can travel freely in the U.S. and serve in our military. The primary difference, of course, is U.S. non-citizen nationals are not allowed to vote for president. And there are a few government positions which are unavailable to them unless they go through the naturalization process. The current arrangement we have with the federal government also grants us the benefit of certain immigration and self-government rights which we have used to preserve our Samoan culture. We are very proud of the American in the term American Samoa as demonstrated by our record numbers of military enlistment. We're also very proud to be Samoan and I personally think there is no disharmony between these two identities. And um, I think back on the time that I uh, uh, taught in the former Soviet Union, where we met with some of the leaders out there, and they were really quite interested in finding out how we could be uh, a Samoan, proud Samoan, and an American as well, given the fact that Washington, D.C is almost 10,000 miles away from the islands. And I, as I explained it to them, there is a kind of an inherent duality that seems to be built in each of us. And um, the only way you can understand it is by being <laughs> American Samoan. And so we are proud Americans. We are also very proud to be Samoans. And they also were fascinated with our ability to hang on to our language and our culture. And, and they wanted to know how that could be. And of course, it's quite simply, it depends on your desire. If you want to hang on to your culture, your language, your traditions, you will, no matter where you go. But uh, during my time serving as a member of Congress, I made it a priority to protect the rights of American Samoans both on island and on the mainland. We all have the right to determine our own future and the shape of our identity. Some choose naturalization, but many choose to remain nationals. I'll do my best to respect the rights of both groups. But yes, I am part of a lawsuit in opposition to a small group of non-residents trying to change the status of all Americans, both residents and non-residents without respect to the nuances of self-determination. It's not a change that should be done using the federal courts, but rather democratically, while accounting for the will of the residents of the territories. And I believe that's where the process should start, at the local level. The first thing we need to do is find out from the people of American Samoa what they want. And uh, so we had referendums here and there, and it has always come back the same answer. They want to keep the status quo. So I'm not aware of any upcoming referendum at this point, but if the American Samoan people should ever decide that is part of their future, I would welcome the process and I would be the first one to push whatever they want in Congress. But whatever the outcome, it'll be respected and I will always fight for the people's choice. And my stance is and always will be that it's for the local people to decide. And as I mentioned earlier, for now, they have decided that the status quo suits them. Let me just uh, add on a bit to what we were discussing a little bit earlier with regard to the US nationals in that whole situation. And because I often get asked uh, whether we would like to remain as two separate entities or, or unite. And uh, so primarily because of the historic closeness to independent Samoa and our history as one people, but two separate, two separate political entities, one is an independent nation and one is a US territory. But we, we need the easy access to workers who can help sustain and grow our economy. Independent Samoa is about three times larger in population and provides essential workers to our cannery and other business. I myself have, have many relatives in the independent state 
of American uh, of Samoa. And uh, so I don't know, but I just wanted to mention that. But uh, so being that it takes almost six hours to fly from Pango Pango to Hawaii, um, the nearest state, we really can't easily practically or financially recruit workers um, from neighboring states such as on the mainland. So um, we are very closely related to the independent state. Uh, we work closely with the consulate office in Apia. And as I mentioned, I have many interrelated family connections and workforce members in Samoa. And so there are often immigration and transit and other issues. You and your, what was your question? <laughs> Um, well, uh, about the working between the House and the Senate sides of the United States Congress. So um, we do work closely together, though obviously we are representatives in the House where our committee work is done. But the uh, Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee has long been prominent in our success as well. Senators Murkowski and Manchin have both been great friends of the territories. And uh, we look forward to working with Chairman Manchin, who will be a key swing vote for all major Senate legislation. And fortunately, who is a good friend of all the territories. Both sides have been very engaged and responsive, both at the member and staff level. So I am sure the territories will be in good shape, no matter who is leading the committee at ENR. Now, uh, the House Natural Resources and Senate ENR have roughly the same jurisdiction as far as the territories are concerned. As you know, their counterparts in this respect. Uh, policies are primarily developed in the House side where the territories have representation and the Senate more often than not reviews and takes into consideration legislation that the House committee has supported. The Senate will generally consult with their House counterparts before moving legislation independent of the House. And it's the main difference. It is a, um, it's a kind of a comedy, not a requirement though. I mean, the Senate is free to move legislation affecting the territories independent of the House. Still, they generally look to the House for initial policy development. And uh, so I do anticipate that in the new Congress that uh, um, we will continue to work closely. Uh, we will still have Chairman Grijalva uh, on the natural resources side. And uh, there will be a new ranking member, Bruce Westerman. Uh, he and I work very closely together. and. Bruce Westerman is also important because he's a close ally and they have a large population of Marshallese in his home district in Arkansas. So he is very supportive on territorial issues. And uh, I should say I have a great working relationship with uh, resident commissioner or Congresswoman Gonzalez Colon. And uh, I mentioned again that Chairman Grijalva has also been very receptive to territorial issues. And uh, I'm looking forward to working with all of them. It should be perhaps stated for the record that the Office of Insular Affairs is where I work is in the executive branch. But, and so we disperse funds that you in Congress uh, determine and, and establish as, as law. Do you have any thoughts about, would you like to comment on um, the work that the Office of Insular Affairs does and how they might relate, how it relates to the work you do in Congress? Yes, OIA is so very important because it's the lead federal partner, not only for American Samoa, but all the other insular areas. And uh, so OIA is more than just a manager of various accounts for schools, hospitals, and local government operations in the territories, which we greatly appreciate. The Office of Insular Affairs is the principal developer of capacity building in each of our jurisdictions helping each of us to develop and prosper. So OIA, you can say, is on the front lines of helping to improve our economic development. 
with a hand up, not just a hand up. Congresswoman, before we close, would you like to tell us about the platforms, the communications platforms that you use from your office uh, to communicate your work to American Samoa as well as back to folks that are in the United States and even in the federal government? As you know, we just recently uh, signed an agreement with the Hawaii Cable, and that has been speeding up our telecommunications. We reach out every way we can, all the different platforms. Not only am I on Facebook, uh, but Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, and some of the other platforms we're taking a look at now, jumping into. And the thing of it is, is that this is something that excites the young people. Another good thing about it is that although their parents don't know much about what an email may be and all of that, they are taking time to work with their parents and the bonding that comes closer together. And one of the things that uh, I discovered when I was down in American Samoa, I visited a high school, I found I was tremendously impressed to see that the teachers had come up with the whole outreach project. Now, some of the schooling has to be virtual and there's time of course for the face-to-face -face kind of classroom teaching. But I, I, um, I was very impressed to see that our high schools, for instance, the principal, the teachers, they have a team that actually goes out into the village, visits these different families, visits the children who are students in the high school, and they talk to them. And uh, so it, it can only mean a better relationship between parents and children because um, I don't think America, American Samoa holds a monopoly on it. But as the, the youngsters become more and more computer literate and the parents are less and less, uh, it's going to kind of separate them. But uh, I was really very impressed to see that the parents were so excited to be able to learn these new things and, and find ways that they can uh, talk to the young people. Uh, one of the things that we do have that we're working on very hard, trying to figure it all out, and it seems to be happening in different parts of the Pacific, and it's this um, committing suicide by young people. And that is something that we are working hard to tackle that, to find out why it's happening. It has got to stop. We don't have that many. We have such a small population to begin with, and when the youngsters are just ending their lives, um, the thing is they need to know that they are not alone. We love them, we want to work with them, and we want to keep them in our community. Thank you, Congresswoman. That, that is a very sad um, subject. Uh, thank you for, um, I, I wanted to just highlight also that you are, uh, on all your platforms, you also put out information in Samoan. Yes, yes, that is, um, that's a given. All of our releases, reports and everything. And uh, I just don't think that any of the other leaders ever thought about doing that, but uh, we have had rave reviews. Many of them are from uh, American Samoans who lived away from the island for so long. And they're just delighted to be able to read this so that they can practice up on their uh, native language. But um, we've, we've gotten nothing but uh, a good positive response. And everything I put out is in two languages. It all depends on how quickly our uh, translators can translate. Thank you, Congresswoman. Uh you know, there's just still so much more. I want you to know that your work has impacted uh, my own work as a Pacific Islander in Washington, D.C., and has helped uh, me in ways that, that you know, you might not even be aware. And so I thank you for that. Um, I also thank you for participating with us on this channel, on this uh, YouTube conversation. Uh, we also at the Office of Insular Affairs are trying new platforms and ways to, to get information out about the work that we do that uh, for the U.S. territories and uh, for the freely associated states uh, sharing information. So thank you for the time that you have taken with us. Uh, do you have any final words that you would like to share with our audience before we go? Yes, thank you, Tanya. 
for this tremendous opportunity to educate people through this ODI OIA forum. The territories and the freely associated states are not universally known. So every little bit of outreach helps. The mission of OIA to help the territories develop economically is an important one. We work on the front lines of developing democracy, showing the world what it's like to be part of a free and open society. There are bumps in the road, of course. This has been a crazy year, 2020, with the COVID crisis. But the president's administration um, is doing an exemplary job for the country. And uh, I think that is most reflected by the inclusiveness of the emergency aid and all administration programs to the territories to their fullest extent possible. So thank you again for all of your effort and thanks to everyone at OIA, uh, including Director Nicolau Nick Pula and all of the team. I know them all, each and every one in your shop. And so forth. God bless the United States and American Samoa. Casalelia, thank you very much, Congresswoman.